hauntings, cryptids, the unknown. Welcome to Mystic Moon Cafe Radio. Listening to Mystic Moon Cafe. Um, I'm here tonight with Cindy McKean of Kansas City Astrology. She's going to be my most gracious co-host. And Hello. we're talking with Roman Delgado about some soul level illness and uh, how he, as a shaman, takes care of such things. Hello. So welcome, everybody. Hi, Roman. It's great to have Hi. you back. It's a pleasure to be back. <laughs> Yay! Woohoo! <laughs> well, I think I finally got everything running and going, and it says the show is live. So, by golly, Woo-hoo. here we are. <laughs> Yay! Yes! Yeah. Yay! So, this seems really interesting, Roman. The soul level illness, which I guess you're looking at it from the perspective of what pe- makes people ill just based on maybe not being on the right life path for instance and how to heal it through shamanic uh through a shamanic process or well that's a huge part of it and that's one of the aspects of shamanic illness and and soul level illness but it's a far more complex issue than that and we're going to be going through many different uh aspects of soul level illness from a shamanic perspective awesome marvelous yes um now you're you're giving classes about this these days aren't you I have in the past, yes. I don't have one in the schedule right now. Mm-hmm. My next class that I'm going to be teaching at Mystic Sanctuary, and then on March again at a psychic fair, 
over in Seattle is going to be about healing ancestral wounds, which is an aspect of soul level illness, which is, you know, ancestral healing. Um, but it is not about the all-encompassing show that we're going to be doing today. It's going to be more, more on that specific aspect of illness, which is generational curses and soul level illness as it pertains yeah. to our ancestors. I have that class set up for Sunday the 15th at Mystic Sanctuary in University Place, Washington. Very nice. Perfect. Alrighty. Um, so and everybody? what's your... Oh, and how could people reach you, Roman, if they wanted to? Like, what's your website or your contact? My website actually has a contact us form. So if people want to send me an email, that is the best way to get a hold of me. Uh, if they want to make uh, to make an appointment with me to come see me at Mystic Sanctuary, I am there on Wednesdays and Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. And I do psychic readings there uh, as well as I do shamanic healing out of that space. Uh, their phone number is 253 Three zero two three five six three, and they can always call and make an appointment with Roman. It is recommended Perfect. if they want to come to see me that they make an appointment like that when they get there. You know, they won't have to wait in line. That's awesome. Now I heard about this um, girl who she had a bit of a stomach ulcer that was developing, mm -hmm. and she actually went to a shaman to to see how she could treat this, and um, he wasn't. Just a mystic shaman. I mean, not, he he had different um, elements at his disposal, you know, such as the natural methods, leaves and things, and, um, you know, different kinds of, uh, you know, just plant medicines in general. And, um, you know, when he first did his scan with her and she told him about her ulcer, he said, and she's a married girl, he said, oh, you're cheating on your spouse, and this is the cause for the ulcer. And it <laughs> dawned on her immediately. Yes, you know what I'm talking about then. And oh. um, as soon as she decided, I'm going to end this relationship, her stomach started to heal. Is this the kind of things that you're talking about, Roman? We're going to go there. But let's let's start from the beginning, okay? okay. Uh, because shamanic and soul-level illnesses have a many different aspects. And we're going to start with your first question about being in the right path, Okay. Okay. Uh, one of the number one aspects of soul level illness from a shamanic perspective is what we call an initiatory illness. Illness that is brought to a human being in order for them to heal that illness by becoming someone of a specific path. Uh, shamans and sorcerers all over the world experience this. I experienced this when I was four years old. I got very, very sick. And my family in Mexico, all of my aunts and uncles were very wealthy. And they took me to see some of the best doctors that, uh, that, that the money could buy. And nobody knew what was wrong with me. Uh, and I, I spoke about this in a previous podcast, how it was one night when there was a very huge storm and all the roads were closed and no doctor could come get me. And no one could take me to see a doctor because of the storm. And I had a five fever and I was dying. And I had a vision of one of the helper spirits, one of the saints that my family works with. And she just looked at me and she goes, you have two choices. You can either work for, for me for the rest of your life or you can go on to join the ancestors and die right now. Now, that is a prototypical shamanic illness uh, that is an initiatory illness that has that level of aspect of by releasing the illness, uh, you enter a specific path. Because when I said yes, that night I got better and I was never sick from that same illness again. Interesting. So that is one aspect of soul level illness. Another aspect would be something a little bit less dramatic. Not everyone who has an initiatory illness is meant to be a shaman. Another example of an initiatory illness was when I left the military and I was dealing with the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, at the very worst of when I had them. I mean, I developed agoraphobia. I could not leave my apartment. That was a shut-in. And by the support of my loved ones and a very strict practice of meditation and energy healing, in particular Reiki, I began to be able to manage my anxiety to the point that even though it still is real and I still have very bad anxiety, I can actually leave the house and do what I have to do. I mean, I have to have some serious help from my mental health care providers and my support system to not go back. But it put me in the path to learn Reiki. So 
initiatory illness is in many ways something that comes to transform us from the inside out in order to relieve, uh, to release ourselves to release aspects of our being that are not in alignment with uh, our life path and our soul's purpose. When we become in alignment with our soul's purpose and we begin walking that path, normally initiatory illnesses go away. So what kind of, give us examples, what kind of initiatory illnesses besides PTSD or an ulcer, what other kinds of things might people experience? Uh, one of the most common ones would be schizophrenia. Oh, wow. For a lot of shamans, uh, I'm going to give you a story that is not mine to, ex- to, 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 to divide the line between an initiatory illness and somebody who's playing out ill, okay? Okay. okay. Uh, many years ago, I was watching an interview of the uh, very prominent anthropologist, Michael Harner, on, uh, on the internet. Uh, he is the, the, the founder of Foundation for Shamanic Studies, who is, uh, I study with the foundation through many of their classes. And Core Shamanism is a great place to start shamanically, to build your practice into something greater. Uh, but he's passed away now. But one of the things that he said in that interview when he was still alive is, is that he remembers being a young anthropologist going to the Hebrew people of the waterfalls in the middle of the Amazon basin. And he started going to the shamans and asking them to to talk to him about their shamanic knowledge. And they refused. So he started, well, I'll go find one of your shamans myself who will do it. And he found this young man who was walking through the jungle, knowing and remembering every tiny little turn and point of this huge jungle that to him was like walking the streets of New York. And he was talking to the trees and to the plants and to the animals. And he will tell my core hunter, this animal is that helps you with this medicine, this plant can cure this illness, this water over here has this property. And he brought him back to the village and he goes, I found him, I found one of your shamans. And the village elders pointed at Michael Harner, started laughing and they went, no, he's not a shaman, he's insane. He's always that way, he can never turn it off. Interesting. So... So is it really then schizophrenia or is it more that someone is attuned to two worlds? Well, it is a level of functionality, much like in traditional allopathic uh, psychology in Western medicine. You know, if, if you cannot ground that spiritual message into reality and actually bring the messages and use them for the well-being, not only of yourself, but your community, it crosses the line from uh, a shamanic calling or a spiritual calling into pure anxiety. And this is one of the biggest concerns that I have right now with the New Age movement and people who consider themselves light workers. You know, the people who are all love and light who talk about raising your energetic vibration to release the pains of the world. Right. A lot of the a lot of them live in an energetic vibration that is so high that they completely forget that they have a physical body and that there are real physical issues that need to be taken care of. And from a shamanic perspective, unless you can ground all of that spiritual medicine into the physical world, you're not living a shamanic life. You're living a life of illness, of spiritual illness, by escaping from the world. And that is at the core of um, of schizophrenia, which is psychosis, that break away from the uh from from the reality that we all share uh a lot of the times when in 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 um in in tribal societies when someone develops schizophrenia they would be taken to the shaman and the shaman would do healing work with them uh some of the things that i will talk about uh, a little bit later in this podcast and they would be they would then when when they were healed and they were no longer in that that space uh they would be trained on how to control that ability to check out of the real world into no ordinary reality into the spirit world and back to receive to to, to take to to take healing from the from non ordinary non ordinary reality into the real world and back and forth that way uh, however, when somebody doesn't have control over it, or when somebody's purely escaping, when you are not willingly becoming a bridge between the real world and non-ordinary reality, what most people call the spirit world, then you're not living a shamanic life or a life of a healer. You are willingly or unwillingly engaging on spiritual illness. 
interesting. I've never really heard it or even thought about it that way before, but that makes absolute sense. Well, you know, I hear a lot of people say, oh, yes, we are a spiritual being having a physical experience. Let's return to the love of the stars and and the planets and all of this beautiful energy that uh, that is really high vibration to, to release the energy of the physical. And that's when I go, hey, uh, excuse me, just think about this for a second, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. If you ignore uh, the physical world because you are a spiritual being having a physical experience, you are missing the point of being here. And they go, what is that? To have that physical experience. It is why so many people are reincarnating into this life cycle over and over and over and over again, reliving this same carnal, painful uh, karmic uh, lessons that most people cannot fathom living over and over. It is because they are not giving themselves fully to that experience and learning those lessons like that. They will need to come back to planets like this in future lifetimes. That's that's, that's like incredible. Ground. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it reminds me of gr- the movie Groundhog's Day. The guy kept on coming back and redoing <laughs> mm-hmm. the day until he got it right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even even mm-hmm. watching that movie was frustrating for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I could empathize. I could empathize with the character so much, you know, about about my own struggles of of my 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 uh, my teachers in ordinary reality giving me the same lessons over and over because I was just wasn't getting it, and I'm like, oh my god, I've been there. I, I'm, <laughs> I have lived Groundhog Day, and I think all of us have had that issue at one point or another. Uh, but the issue is not necessarily that we have that repetitive issue of, of karmic lessons coming back to us. The issue is is whether or not we engage it consciously. That's a big point, yes, because there's a lot of people that wouldn't face it. They just avoid it, and that doesn't get rid of it. It just carries it over to the next life. Precisely. Mm -hmm. Um, Here in Tacoma, a friend of mine and I at the store that I do my readings and my classes at, we started a psychic fair called Whispering Shadows. And we specialize on the polar opposite of the New Age movement. We call ourselves dark workers. <laughs> Not in the aspects that we work with dark, evil entities all the time. Mm-hmm. But some, of pe- some people do, but it's not why we call ourselves dark workers. It is because we do not put a spiritual band-aid on the issues. And we don't ask our clients to raise their vibration to run away from the physical, you know. We look at our clients and we tell them those deep, visceral messages about the physical experiences they need to master, whether they're happy or not, in order for them to do something about it and have a better life. And I think that's an aspect of psychic work and healing work that has been profoundly lost in Western culture due to the advent of the New Age movement. Because the New Age movement is so much about soothing the wound and transcending the pain that people don't seem to realize that sometimes moving through the pain is the best thing to do. Yeah, take care of the source rather than the symptom. Precisely. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, so many people in the New Age movement blame Western medicine for doing the same thing, and yet here they are. Yeah. But you that finds a balance. Precisely. Mm-hmm. And that is the energy of, 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 of that we're talking about, of, of spiritual illness. And in the case of initiatory illness, it is particularly dangerous. Because when you find yourself a healer who just treats the symptoms and releases the illness... What happens to the initiatory experience then? You get someone whose initiation into a spiritual path gets cut short and is not properly initiated because all they did was treat the symptoms and they did not guide them into a better way of being. They did not help them find their path as a healer or as a teacher or even as a lawyer or whatever it is they were being called to do. When we just treat the symptom and not go for the core and help people find the lesson within the illness that is at a soul level, we are stopping people from learning the lessons from the illness. And in the case of this first illness we're discussing, which is initiatory illness, we're stopping someone from making a life-changing transformation, not only for themselves, but something that would have impacted everyone they would have met for the rest of their lives. And that is very profound. That is why we have to be very careful of the healers that we trust. Mm 
and how well-rounded they are, not only in the spiritual realm, but how well-grounded they are in reality. So when you say that they carry this over lifetimes, is it a cumulative? Does it, you know, end up getting more and more in mass? Or is it just circular where they recycle the same problems and go through it again and again? Simply well, like, you know, as straightforward as it was, say, in the movie. It is a circular thing. But the people who are in charge of karma, the spiritual beings in non ordinary reality, tend to get a little bit uh, testy with us. If we're not getting the point, the lessons are going to be given in a more visceral way the more you refuse to learn it. Yeah. It is kind of like dealing with your parents, you know. If every time you leave the ha- they leave the house to go to work, you throw a party, you know, the, the consequences you're going to receive each time you do it are going to be a little bit more difficult for you as a teenager to deal with. Because right. let's face it. For the, those who run the spirit world, we are basically children. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. They're older than time itself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, um, in order to be a shamanic healer, is having a soul level illness that you know someone walks through and treats themselves through, um, is that a requirement to become a shamanic healer? Well, it is a requirement to become a shaman, but not a shamanic healer. You know, okay. in traditional uh, tribal societies and societies that carry over the same teachings that their ancestors in tribal societies did, it is very common for either a shaman or a sorcerer to have my experience. I don't call myself a shaman. Uh, I call myself a shamanic practitioner out of respect for the cultures who originated the term shaman. The term shaman comes from the Tungus uh, tri- tribe of Siberia, and it means he who sees in the dark. And it was exclusively used for their medicine people. And I am not a part of that tribe. So in order for me to di- differentiate the fact that I am not from that part of the world, I call myself a shamanic practitioner. Not everybody who wants to learn shamanic skills has to be a shaman. Some people can, by all means, learn to shaman, do shamanic journey, to leave their bodies in trance and retrieve medicine and healing and work. Uh, the ability to do shamanic journey and enter alter states of consciousness, be it to plant medicine or to drumming or rattling or dancing or singing, it's a fundamental part of being human. All human beings are capable of altering the state of their minds. I mean, otherwise people would never get drunk. (laughs) Um. Uh, However, just because you can alter your mind to the point of doing a shamanic journey, that doesn't make you a shaman. What makes a shaman a shaman or a shamanic practitioner is your relationship with the spirit world, with the ancestors, with the teachers in ordinary reality, with with all of these beings that you work together with in order for you to retrieve the healing and wisdom that is coming across the veil into this world. It is that relationship that you keep sacred and you live day by day that is the core of who you are and what you live that is the difference. Um, uh, um, Shabbat. It- how, how does the shaman differ from a, you know, it's, they say shamans are, have been around since basically the beginning of, of mankind as well. But um, how, how do they differ from, say, the village wise woman or, or witch, basically? Um, well, what, the, sh- the shaman is the ancestor of the village witch. Okay. The shaman was the beginning of that energy that later evolved into a more magical system. Uh, In traditional shamanic lore, the village witch would be more considered of a sorcerer or a sorceress, someone who can use this level of energy to manipulate life uh, in many different ways. The shaman in most societies is more concerned with healing work, uh, with keeping his community together in a healthy way, and make sure that everybody has enough food, enough shelter, enough of everything. They are basically the central pillar for the well-being of their communities. Mm-hmm. While a witch has the ability to do so much more, like you know, um, like a, like cast a spell to attract this, or cast a spell to 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 do impart justice. For example, a lot of shamans that I have met in my work and shamanic practitioners would not touch a justice spell with a 10-foot pole and somebody else's drum. (laughs) (laughs) That is just not what we do. Uh, But 
people who practice witchcraft in that traditional village witch way, a lot of the times when the village was in danger because somebody was being a jackass, they had no problem doing that. So a lot of those functionalities that evolved out of shamanism into being the village witch and the modern witch are something that evolved at a later point as society grew to a different level into a different type of society, and they are no longer needed. Uh, uh, in uh, the, They're more needed for the for the present time, but they were not needed for the shaman. That's very now, interesting. Very good, very good definition there. Now, does a, a shaman, is, are they usually a certain age before they become a shaman, or could this, is it just they're born this way and enlightened and... No, you know. it, it, there is no age uh, limitation. I mean, my, my calling came when I was four years old. I have seen uh, uh, documented work from, from anthropologists about shamans who started doing the work in the 30s or 40s. So there is nothing telling that. It is when the time is right for that person to begin the work. Nice. Basically, you could have the, the calling when you're just a... Uh, a child, but you have to wait so long before you can actually start the path, correct? That is correct. Sometimes we're not ready. Sometimes we haven't matured enough in the teachings mm -hmm. that the teachers in our reality and our physical teachers pass on to us to do work with other people. So that is definitely a part of the thing. And it is all surrounding our understanding of illness. Uh, now that we talked about um, initiatory illness, did you guys have any more questions about initiatory illness? Not I right don't now. believe so. Nope. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, anytime there's any questions for me, let me know. Uh, I love ask, uh, answering questions when, when, sure. when I talk about the this, uh, this subjects. That's why I uh, brought Cindy on with, because she's usually the, the biggest question asker in the, <laughs> in the chat rooms. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I mean, this would save me a little. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there is an energy in shamanic illness and in soul level illness in particular, okay? Not just shamanic illness, but soul level illness that people don't seem to understand, okay? And it's more than just the physical. If we take away the physical aspect of illness, because that's not my job to talk about, I am not a doctor, so I don't talk about that. In the spiritual level of illness, there is a certain components that separate the types of illness. There is the illness that has to do with, for example, energy blockages in our system. Human bodies are not designed to hold uh, uh, energy statically, to just sit there. They are designed to filter energy and concentrate it and make it stronger. And we're basically giant energy capacitators that energy flows in and energy flows out. And when the energy flows out, is stronger and more powerful. Uh, it's very similar to trees, how they take in carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. The difference is, is that we human beings, our bodies do that with energy. However, sometimes that becomes uh, thrown out of balance and blocked. And the reason for that being is something that for me as a psychic and as a healer really ticks me off. And is this cockamamie, ass backwards, completely idiotic idea that American culture has evolved that we don't need to find healthy ways to voice our emotions. That blowing off some steam in a healthy way is a bad thing. That we're supposed to swallow our pride, swallow our anger, swallow our pain and our sorrow or whatever negative emotion we have to the pit of our belly, put ourselves by our bootstraps and just soldier on and move on. That is a very unhealthy thing to do. I have quite literally lost count of the clients of mine who come to me for a reading to see what's potentially ailing them in a spiritual way that could help their lives. And I see, and I see in, in my readings that they have uh, abdominal issues and throat issues. And this is deeply done because they've been swallowing their emotions. And this is compounded even more when they go to healers who come from the New Age movement, who tell them that all they need to do is to grow roots from the bottom of their feet or from the, uh, from the root chakra and ground the energy into the earth. And I just look at them and go, do you understand the, 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 the mechanics of the chakra system or of energy centers? Not every negative energy or negative emotion is supposed to be given to the earth to recycle because some energies are toxic to the lower energy centers. That is why when we are angry, we say something about it because if we swallow it, we normally get sick. Mm -hmm. Definitely. 
This is when I go back to uh, to seeing this example about the lady who had that ulcer. She was swallowing an emotion that was not healthy for his uh, and a thought, an idea, and an emotions, and emotions that her stomach was not prepared to digest. That's amazing. Right. And that, yeah. is, that is one aspect of soul level illness that most people don't seem to understand and is the proper way of dealing with emotions. You know, I have clients of mine that they swallow so much of their emotions that their livers have been given issues that they could potentially die from it. I have clients who have thyroid issues who they've been taking so much medication and nothing is working. And when I cast my bones in front of them and talk about their life, they go, no, oh, yes, I've been swallowing my truth, not speaking it for many years. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, it, blood pressure, um, just everything. If you don't deal with it instead of, yeah, swallow it or, or tamp it down and, and keep until, you, until basically your head blows off. Pretty much. I'm, yeah. I'm going to give you guys another story. Okay. okay. If you haven't figured out by all the podcasts I've done with y'all, I love stories. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I and we love your Reiki stories. Re- yes. <laughs> I was in a Reiki retreat many years ago in upstate New York. Okay. Mm -hmm. I still love going to those retreats when I have the money. Um, Mm -hmm. And we were doing Reiki for people. And this lady sits on the, on, on the table, lays down on the massage table. And I have my hands on her feet to channel Reiki energy through my body into her body to help her heal. Uh, my Reiki teacher used to tell me that sometimes you're not going to be aware that anything is going on. Like in your mind, Reiki is not working. And she used to tell me, do it anyway. So I lay my hands on her feet for about an hour and a half to two hours. And I was just sitting there like nothing is happening. I don't feel anything. There are no psychic hits, nothing. I am blank. I just pretending that I'm doing something and I'm only doing it because my teacher in Reiki told me that whether I feel it or not, is not important. It is my client's experience that's important. At the end of the session, I take my hands off her feet. There were other people treating other parts of her body. All of us take our hands off of her. She thanks us all, and she doesn't say anything to me. She just gives me this very strange look. And then she walks away, uh, and she had a walker, okay? The next morning after breakfast, she walks in, and she doesn't have her walker with her. And then she goes, Roman, I went to my bedroom uh, at the end of the healing session yesterday crying. And then she goes, why? And I asked her why. And then she goes, for the last 10 years, I've been having issues with my feet getting swollen, and I could not walk. Yesterday, I cried myself out while you were he- had your healing hands on me. And now my feet are not swollen. And for some strange reason, I am no longer afraid to walk my own path. Wow. Wow. That's fantastic. Well, and you bring, I think, a good example of, you know, with this energy exchange, I think we all have to be careful about each other because sometimes you get the wrong Reiki person and they're putting the wrong kind of energy into people. Well, yeah. One of the things about Reiki, okay, and this is not a show about Reiki. If you guys want to do a completely separate show about Reiki. (laughs) But Reiki is supposed to be all about put your hands down and get out of the way. When Reiki practitioners and Reiki teachers allow their own, uh, their own sense of self, anything that comes from them to be a part of the session, that's when you get something going wrong. I see. Being a Reiki practitioner is being empty. Being the empty, the hollow bone from a shamanic perspective, actually, that passes the energy. There is nothing inside of you. Just just like a hose that is ch- that is flowing Reiki through into other people's hands. It is only when you invest any part of yourself as a Reiki practitioner into the healing that something can go potentially wrong. Now, this energy flowing through the body is this, and the pathway it's through, is that the same as ki or chi? Well, the word reiki is a combination of the words rei and ki, which is Japanese for chi. It's okay. just Japanese instead of Chinese. Rei means universal or universe, and chi means energy. So, um, But that's, we're getting sidetracked. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's okay. When... Now, when you're talking about the people swallowing down, because we're going back to these illnesses, right? Mm -hmm. People swallowing down on their anger 
and it creating problems, say, with their liver or their gut or whatever. Now, is this really, I mean, because a lot of times people make it out as if it's the individual's issue or that problem, but really it sounds to me like it's more of a societal problem. You know, like it, when you see little boys fighting and they want to punch each other, you let them hit it out because that's how little boys take care of it. They grow up to men, and I don't think they're really allowed to do that so much without the risk of jail. <laughs> Well, it is part of a societal problem that we don't teach our children and our adults how to properly deal with anger. I think society speaking, societally speaking, that is that is the issue. Uh, because even even from a warrior perspective, uh, someone who has been training in martial arts on and off my entire life, I got to tell you that when you train in martial arts as a warrior, they always tell you a fight is the last thing you want to actually do. What you need to do is have the discipline of being able to be in space, hold space for your own emotions, feel it, felt it, let it go, and allow the flow of chi, the flow of ki, whatever you call it, that we normally channel through our martial arts to move healthily through you. Now, sometimes in order to do that, we need to express it. And that's why we practice martial arts. That's why people who do karate do their katas. That's why people who do kung fu do their forms, because they're working out their issues through movement. Uh, One of the number one things I tell my clients, and I'm going to use this one because uh, I'm talking to two ladies. And I love giving my my female uh, uh, clients this homework. And that is very simple. When I sense that they're hanging on to an emotion that no longer serves them, I tell them, uh, what are you going to do? You're going to take your favorite girlfriend. You're going to take your favorite queenie gay guy or both. Mm. You're going to go to your club, your favorite safe karaoke bar. You're going to drink a couple of margaritas and you're going to sing your heart out about all that bullshit you're going to, you're going through and you're going to let it out. And if anybody's mean to you, your favorite sassy girlfriend and your favorite queenie gay guy are going to defend you. (laughs) <laughs> I like that. Yep. <laughs> and normally they love that homework and they do it and they feel a lot better. And that's just one way of expressing. Sometimes I tell my clients to write letters and burn them. Sometimes I tell them if they dance to dance. Sometimes I have people who are artists who I tell them to paint or I tell them to write music or to draw. I mean, it depends on what their favorite form of expression is. And the thing that is going on here is not only that we are taught to swallow our emotions is is that we are uh, a society that loves to censor people and censorship at a spiritual level is the issue here spiritual censorship interesting okay so the censorship creates this lack of selfhood yeah definitely it, la- yeah. it, it takes away your sense of self and it takes uh, uh, your sense of power, which I'll talk about power loss here in a second. So that is the energy of energy blockages, which is one aspect of soul level illness. Um, but there's more to soul level illness as well, which is the energy of when that energy becomes a miasma, it becomes a poison inside of us that our very energy system gets sick. That, that are people who know about chakras, their chakras stop spinning in the right direction, or their aura gets cracked and it starts leaking, or other things. But there's also the energy when we break to pieces and we don't return completely together. And that, sure. leaves, that leaves holes in our aura. And those holes can be filled with illness. So that is more closer to the spectrum of shamanic illness. Uh, but it is a combination of energetic illness and shamanic illness that is normally present because all of the shamanic illnesses that I'm going to speak about have an energetic component that it's like a virus of their own. So let me ask Roman then, if somebody is living their path and this way, you know, they should therefore be, you know, healthy, so to speak, soulfully and spiritually but they have a lot of haters around them. Mm-hmm. Can't that affect them? I mean, is there anything as being immune to, to this kind of energy? Or is that some of the energy that could actually create this kind of illness? Yeah, uh, we talked about, about Indelia, about envy in a previous podcast, actually. Yeah. Uh, but it's definitely worth repeating that in order for someone to walk their path authentically, uh, we need to learn uh, uh, proper energetic hygiene. 
Yeah. Just because uh, we live our life and we take a shower every day and we clean our bodies and we keep our homes clean, why can't we do the same with our energy? Because, yes, you're going to be walking through a sea of thoughts and emotions and all sorts of things that people are spewing out of their energy system into the air. And some of that stuff can definitely stick to you and make you sick. When I come home from doing my readings, every day that I do it, I cleanse myself uh, with a chicken foot. That's a hoodoo thing, a conjure thing. Conjure men and women use a uh, dry chicken foot to, to cleanse away like minor negativity from the day. And I do regular uh, work to send back negativity that was more heavily cast upon me because of my work on the regular basis. And I do regular like ritualized baths that I do to cleanse away negativity. So having tools for each individual who's dealing their path, out, living their path authentically and have a good life in order to release the energies of jealousy or, pe or pettiness or whatever other toxicity they're encountering is needed. Uh, and I think that's another shame that we're not taught that in American culture, how to keep our energy clean. Uh, I mean, most people know about sage and things like that, but it gets to a certain point when sage is not enough. No. And, uh, yeah, I think the mainstream way of uh, promoting spiritual hygiene is to t just tell people that blanket statement of think positive. Um, but it's not enough either. I think it's a whole lifestyle change. It is a complete lifestyle change to learn to keep your energies healthy, to have healthy boundaries as well. You know, yeah. uh, because I'm about to talk about holes in, in your energy system. If you have a huge hole in your aura, it doesn't matter how much sage you burn. You basically have an open wound that people can continue to throw dirt into and get it infected. If you have crack, cracks in your energy field that the slime of people's envy can get into energetically and make you sick, it doesn't matter how much sage you burn. You need to seal up that crack. You know, that's why the, 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 the responsible, well-versed energy healer and the responsible shaman, shaman or shamanic practitioner is needed because there are some levels of energetic illness that we can't deal with on our own. That's and pretty it, profound. Yes, it is. <laughs> very much so. <laughs> and then sometimes when you're in there living your life, it's hard to spot where the problems are, what what you have going on. You need someone and someone with an outside perspective to look in. That's why most shamanic practitioners and shamans have a system of divination that we use and why energy healers are very well trained to plane out, either look at or spiritually sense someone's energy and know what's going on with them. And yeah. So it's necessary to find someone who has the right tools to help you. Mm -hmm. And not every healer is going to be right for uh, pr uh, the proper healer for each individual case. I've had cases that I told them, you know, I can do a little bit for you, but you need to see an energy healer or you need to go see that particular practitioner or that one. Um, because not all of us have the the right tool set or hold the right vibration to help someone. I am a very fiery, very intense, very passionate person. And if I have someone who's very delicate and a very delicate emotional state that they can fall to pieces any moment, I will be way too much for them to deal with. <laughs> and I have to acknowledge that. And it will not be responsible for me to bring them into my space, knowing that I'm going to overwhelm them in the process of helping them. So it is why we need to have responsible healers who know themselves and know their craft more than anyone else. Sure. Just like picking your doctor, you know, one one will work and one another won't, and even if they're, you know, specialists in their field. I understand that. Completely. Now, any other questions about what we've been talking about or can I move on to the next type uh, of Yeah, Don't keep me. going. Okay. And feel free to, 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 if a question pops up, just let me know. Okie doke. Sure. Uh, there is also the energy of power loss. Um, most people are familiar with the term totem, okay, which actually came from my neck of the woods. The Coast Salish tribes of the Pacific Northwest have the term totem animal. In Mexico, we call them tonali in Aztec or nawali in Nahua, in, uh, in Toltec. 
and they are a piece of our own soul. They are like a, a like like a part of who you are, but they're also somewhat like a lot like a Catholic guardian angel. Power animals are the embodiment of everything that is positive about you. They are your strength, your wisdom, your sense of humor, your character, everything that you need in order to navigate this world. In some traditional societies, like in Mexican culture, we are taught as children, uh, those of us who grew up with that lore, that they've been with us from the beginning, from when we were born and possibly from before that. And that they are assigned to us for life. Some cultures are taught that you have to have one um, retreat for you by a shaman because, you know, most people no longer have a power animal. And some system of, of systems of shamanic teaching that people teach nowadays uh, teach you that, that, that unless a shaman brought one back for you, you don't have a power animal. That goes against my cosmology that I learned as a child from my elders, against my 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 way to view not ordinary reality uh, that I was taught that we'll have one uh, but your power animal is also your guide and your protector mm -hmm. imagine that you have a pet that you really cherish and this pet is so smart that it's basically human and it's this pet is, mm -hmm. and it's incredibly incredibly smart like he mm -hmm. could have gone to Harvard smart <laughs> he could have gone to an Ivy League college smart Mm -hmm. And his specialty is your spirituality. That is your power animal like. And much like a normal animal, let's say that you have a break in into your house and they try to hurt you, he's going to try to defend you. Mm -hmm. And if somebody kicks him across the room and breaks his uh, bones in a few pieces, that animal is never going to be the same. And it's very similar to what happens with power animals when we go through trauma that they cannot help us through. They, they themselves become wounded and run away because that's all they can do. It's a and we lose for them. Mm -hmm. They are defeated. Mm -hmm. And they, we lose that part of ourselves. And that's where we normally end up with huge chunks of sacred energy missing from our aura. It is where that power animal was nesting. And that's when all of this energy comes in. How many of you have heard the term empath? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. Probably. This is, else. well, this is where I'm going to burst the bubble of a lot of people. And normally when I say that in my classes, I lose at least five people after I say what I'm about to say. <laughs> But most, the vast majority of people in this world who claim to be empaths are not empaths. <laughs> Empathy is one of the number one signals of soul level illness. And it normally represents as, as a really powerful level of empathy that cannot be controlled because it is a result of that hole in the aura where all of these emotions are coming through without being filtered. In that aspect, that giant hole in the aura where the power animal used to be or other soul piece used to be is basically an extra chakra that cannot be opened or closed. It's permanently working full force, sucking up all of the energy around them. And that is why people, a lot of people, not all of them, but why a lot of people who fully feel their empaths are empaths and they cannot turn it off. It's because there is a very primal soul level wound that has them sucking up the energy from the world around them without them being able to stop it. I had that issue for many years. And when I started working with shamans uh, around my community on soul retrieval work, now I don't have an empathic bone on my body. I have the empathic abilities of a baked potato. <laughs> and I used to be an epic empath. And I, and I realized through the process of doing shamanic killing for myself with other people that that was the source of things. And I have seen it on so many of my clients And I tell them, if you come to see me for shamanic healing, I guarantee you that a lot of your psychic abilities will change. Some of them will go away, and new ones that are more natural to a healthy version of you will come to surface for you to go work with. Um, when you said there was people who would have a permanent hole in their aura, is that really permanent, or is there, you know, is, is there a way? Is there a hope? Oh, it's definitely hope. Uh, you could actually go to a shaman or a shamanic practitioner 
who can exit their body into non ordinary reality and find an animal who feels bad that you're going through all of this crap without an animal and wants to come back and be your power animal. And see. Mm-hmm. So that's when we go through what we call a shamanic extraction to clean the wound. And then the shaman would go into northern inner reality, into trance, and retrieve the power animal and place it in that freshly clean wound and uh, do some energy work to, to, to help integrate. How does someone know what their, um, what their animal is? Normally, uh, they present themselves in moments of trance. So people who do not know how to enter an altered state of consciousness very seldomly know what the power animal is. I mean, at the very most, it happens when they have those coincidences, those synchronicities, that the animal keeps popping up everywhere and they don't know why. Uh, That is the more common thing. But the vast majority of the people that I have retrieve animals for, they're like, they had no idea. Or I took them through meditations, through guiding visualization, to meet their already existing healthy power animal that they had. And they're like, wow, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> and when you see, when you found their animals for them, how, how much of a match does it really feel? I mean, because when I hear people talk about their power animals, they talk about wolves or bears or unicorns. I mean, I, I'm kind of thinking it should be a little bit more individual, but is it really that narrow an archetype? Well, see, this is the thing when it comes to expectations and shamanic healing. People have this idea that uh, it's going to be unique to them, right? Mm -hmm. That it's going to be a perfect match to them. But people don't realize something very interesting about humanity. It says that separation is an illusion. Individuality largely is an illusion. We all have families we all have jobs. We all, most of us live in cities. Most of us live in Western society with similar values. Most of us have the same type of issues at work, the same type of issues with our families. We all have bodies that get sick the same way. I mean, all of these challenges that we face as individuals are shared in the human experience. The idea that we're a tiny, separate little snowflake and there's no other snowflake exactly like us, it is a pipe dream. And this is bubble, me pointy thing again. (laughs) We are part of a larger subset of energy called humanity. And we are all connected and we have a lot of similarities. And because of that, uh, that idea that is going to be that that specific only for you is a little bit uh, myopic of a viewpoint. Um, But at the same time, the, the lessons that that power animal has, they can very much apply specifically to the individual aspects of the human experience you are currently going through. Sometimes your power animal changes. Sometimes your power animal leaves and another one comes back because let's say that you stop working as a teacher and now you're going to school to be a nurse. You're not going to need the same lessons so another power animal will teach you that. Now, are you the only person uh, who's starting to be a nurse on the planet? No, Mm -hmm. but you are the one that needs those lessons right now. Mm -hmm. Um, Question in the chat room from Jen. um, uh, It it goes back a little bit uh, before the power animals, but um, uh, how do these holes affect us in our daily lives? Well, Number one, uh, uncontrolled psychic abilities. Mm -hmm. But the holes in our aura uh, have the ability to make us leak life force, make us leak our vital energy. So we can become incredibly drained and susceptible to illness. It is where uh, spiritual beings that can create illness enter our body and they can create many forms of illness in a physical, mental, emotional, spiritual self and even in aspects of our lives. The holes are where we're bleeding out what makes us strong and powerful, and we're soaking in everything that makes us uh, sick. Very well put. Thank you. Um, and in the same time, you know, talking about power, power animals. Mm-hmm. Power animals, without your power animal, uh, the patterns that come across as well go even further than just the normal holes in you are off from toxic emotion. Because your power animal is your sense of will and your sense of power. I have lost counts of the people who I have worked with that tell me that they do feel fundamentally powerless to fix their lives. That they feel that there's nothing that that they can do. 
that they and said. that comes mm-hmm. more than stuck, literally powerless. Like if they had to walk across the room to fix it, that they would be on the ground crying. And that is comes fundamentally from moments of trauma, moments when something horrendous happened, and their power animal left, and they were powerless to help themselves through that. Women who have been through abusive relationships, men and women who have been abused, children who have been abused, uh, soldiers who have been in war, people who had the love of their lives stolen away or who broke up the one relationship that mattered to them. Uh, one thing that I uh, hate about modern society and the type of work that I do is the energy of my trauma is worse than yours. That is a horrible thing to do to someone. Yes. Just because there is something that is stereotypically more traumatizing to someone than the other doesn't mean that it wasn't earth shattering for them to have that one little thing happen. Don't put your standards of your trauma into someone else because you have not walked your life in their shoes and in their path for them. For example, let's say that it wasn't war, that what led the power animal to leave was the fact that their husband left them uh, and they ended up being single again after many years and they did not want that. Maybe that breakup was completely earth shattering to them. Maybe they had their whole sense of self invested in that relationship and poof, it's gone. So, yeah, it's it's a big deal because with, it leaves us without a defense. It leaves us powerless. Mm-hmm. And that that rolls over into being powerless to heal our bodies and being powerless to heal our emotions and being powerless to stop cycles of negativity within our lives. Does that also leave us desireless to other power animals to come and be attracted and take that role? No, no. no. Uh, but uh, what can happen is, is that uh, not necessarily desireless, but hopeless. Right. Hopeless is a better word. Mm-hmm. I have never seen desireless. I have seen hopeless. Um, what about like a so undesirable is not a quality that ends up? No, I haven't okay. seen it, but I have seen hopeless. Sure, that that goes hand in hand with powerless quite often. One thing that that I will say as well before. Uh, before uh, we ask, uh, before we move on, because I wanted to definitely talk about this when it came to power animals, and and we do have one more question in the chat room. Um, can people be born with soul illnesses, or are they a manifestation of our specific lives? I have seen people who had soul illnesses so old that they had no memory of them. Yeah. That they have always been this way, as far as I can remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I did divination for them, my divination system corroborated that it was that way from the very beginning. I personally don't work very much with past lives because I haven't had enough training from my teachers to do that. Okay. Uh, I can do past life regression to help them understand the wound. And from there, we can work on something. But yeah, there is definitely possibilities that that's the case. So, Ramon, to go into this altered state you were talking about, how does one do that? I use a drum or a rattle, repetitive beat of a drum or a rattle, about 220 beats per minute. That's an easy one. Mm -hmm. You know, the tap, almost like, are you familiar with EDM, electronic dance music? Yes. The tap of stuff they do at raves that has a very repetitive, very fast beat. Ah, uh, yes. They call it trance music. Uh-huh. That is the reason okay. why. Mm-hmm. Because that beat of the of, of, of the music it induces an altered state of consciousness. And, and how convenient that at those, at those concerts, they also have things to help you with those altered states of consciousness. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the cross-cultural part in shamanic healing about how to get into an altered state is music. Uh, 
there are many cultures that use substances, like, for example, the very famous vine of life, the ayahuasca of the Amazon, or the San Pedro, the tears of the San Pedro cactus in, in Peru, or um, of the of the uh, mushrooms of the Oaxaca, of the uh, of the of the people of uh, Oaxaca in Mexico, uh, the Mazatec the Mazatec Indians. There are plant medicines that can induce it, but they are not cross cultural. They're actually a minority within shamanic. Uh, within shamanic cultures. Most shamanic cultures use music or dance. Or both, yeah. right? Yeah. Or Combination. both, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, or both. It, it always takes me to, like, the, the sweat lodges and with the drum music behind and, and that type of thing, too. Definitely, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm thinking in the Far East, they might use, like, the quartz or the um, Tibetan type of singing bowls. Yeah. Um, back to power animals, because yes. I wanted to make sure I made this statement. Okay. One of the number one things that you can do to lose your power animal and end up powerless is talking about him. Hmm. People who go, oh, my God, I went to this psychic and she told me that my power animal was a unicorn. And oh, my God, that's <laughs> so totally true because I have unicorns everywhere. <laughs> Talking now of, I yeah now now I pass gas and it's all sparkly yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not trying to be a jerk about it, but bubble mean pointy thing again. Mm-hmm. To speak to other people about not only who your power animal is and what you do with them outside of a therapeutic set with a shaman or a shamanic practitioner, it's like revealing what happened between you and your wife in your wedding night to your friends the next morning. Mm-hmm. Sacred. It is sacred. Mm -hmm. And it is a huge violation of that intimate connection that you're supposed to be having with your power animal. I have lost count of the people who said that they had a lot of deep connection with their power animal, that they had gone to shamans and practitioners who helped them get in touch with them. And all of a sudden they lost it. And I told them, well, what did you do? It's like, nothing. Did you talk about it a lot? And I goes, well, yeah, it was an amazing experience. I wanted to share it with my friends. And that's when I have to go, well, bubble me, pointy thing. <laughs> I do that a lot. Um, not a good idea to go out and buy the wolf t-shirt if you find out your power animal is the wolf. Right. <laughs> well, and it has a dual form of danger associated with it. And that is the fact that if you find a sorcerer or a witch that is very good at their craft, they can use the weaknesses of your power animal against you. Oh, wow. Sure. Yes. That, that's a very personal, that, that would mm. almost be as good as, as hair or toenail clippings, right? That is correct. Mm-hmm. They can, hit they can get hurt. past your power animal's defenses to harm you. Mm-hmm. Because now, when does... it comes to psychic attacks, your power animal is your number one line of defense. So does everybody have a power animal? In time, my culture, in yeah. my culture, we are taught yes. Uh, it depends on the culture that you span from and what what that culture's cosmology is. There are some cultures that they say no, you have to have one retreat. Personally, the way I was taught and when I researched the beliefs of my ancestors as an adult, it was something that we were born with. Okay. Um question in the chat room um can you get the animal back once it leaves from talking about it never the same one okay but you can get another one that's pretty severe yeah it is an insult and for someone who was there to help you out of the goodness of their heart and was willing to save your life and put his life on the line for you it is an even greater insult is it always an animal? Yes. Bugs cannot be power animals. Every time I've seen bugs on people, they have been a sign of illness. Sure. Good. Even butterflies? Even butterflies. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's make an example again, okay? Okay. Just because a butterfly is pretty doesn't mean it belongs where your liver should be. Yeah, that's true. It is not a question of good or evil or bad or good. It means that there are certain things that are, are out of place. I and know bugs, um, bugs in some cultures, 
they have mm-hmm. it where if the butterfly is flying nearby your chest, you have to watch out for your heart. It's trying, you know, they believe it's an indication of a heart flutter. Yeah. Normally, in a lot of shamanic traditions around the world, bugs are a sign of illness. And that is something that my own experience has shared. Wow. And it's interesting, we've been talking about power loss. Not only can a sorcerer use your power animal to get, and it knowing its weaknesses to get around you, around their defenses, to, and harm you without them protecting you. Let's say that you're a very powerful woman and that you're on your way of becoming a CEO in a Fortune 500 company, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you have a rival businesswoman who wants to get your job. <laughs> and she finds a very crafty sorcerer that she can pay a lot of money to get what you have. All she has to do is know your animals, uh, the type of animal that you have, and she can steal them from you. And at that moment, yeah. everything that was good about you will be hers. And she can even use it to control you or even kill you. Mm-hmm. Never. So how would she know someone else's power animal? It, besides these altered states, I mean, is this going to be, is your power animal your secret, essentially? Yes. It is an absolute secret, and it should always be. So the only way someone else would know is if you share that with them, but they can't Precisely. get it through using, say, a um, little gin or something to, to retrieve that information, right? Uh, some very skilled uh, sorcerers can divine a power animal to steal it, but they're incredibly rare nowadays. Okay. People who can do that are very rare nowadays. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And scary. Yeah. In my culture, uh, when a partera, a curandera who specialized in birthing children came, one of the first things after the children was born, she would give him a name that only the family knew. A name that only the mother knew as well, which was the soul's name that he came from the spirit world into this world already named. Then the name that the family had for them. And then they had a third name that the entire community know him by, your real name. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is more of an indigenous thing in Mexico. They also gave the mom the identity of the power animal. And when you are old enough to responsibly deal with that energy, you will be told. Nice. Um, Now, uh, another question from chat. Um, Can you get rid of these bugs that bring illness? When you come to someone like me who does shamanic killing, the mm-hmm. first thing we do when we see a wound in your aura that has a lot of this bug type of energy for shamanic illness is get rid of them. It's called a shamanic extraction. When we take out the components of energy that are illness, we release them safely. And then once the wound is clean, we replace it with your power animal or whatever other healing needs to be in that place. Be aware, depending on how severe the case is, many times it can take several sessions. Mm. Well, that makes sense. Sure. You, we got you some might... comment. Mm-hmm. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, you go, ahead. go ahead. Oh, I just, I was thinking, yeah, if you, that could drain you just as quickly as the illness itself, having the, the healing, I'm sure. It so can it get would... really intense. Mm-hmm. I've, I've had healings myself that I've done in which I was going and I was doing the shamanic extraction. And my teacher in this in known ordinary reality in the spirit world, right in the middle of it, right when he was getting really intense, she says, stop. It's like, what? Well, tell him to come back in a month. He can't take it anymore. Mm-hmm. You're going to overwhelm him and you're going to hurt him. So I had to stop. We finished the session. I, I patched up the wound. And then he tells, I told him what happened. And he goes, oh, thank God. It's like, what? I, I, I would have gone insane because shamanic extraction in many occasions, it can get really intense. Goodness. Yeah. <laughs> um, Especially but, if the wound is very visceral emotionally. Oh, sure. Yeah. We have um, some comments that is important to share from the audience. So one said, McMenamin says, great guest. He's so informative. Mm -hmm. We have another comment. We love Roman. He knows his business. And another person (laughs) saying, Roman is the best. Oh, thank you, guys. (laughs) And also, uh, Steph is saying she's pretty sure she needs some healing. 
I would suggest going to the website of, foundation, of the Foundation for Shamanic Studies, www.shamanism.org, and they have a, um, a, a directory of people who have been trained in basic shamanic healing techniques. And many of them have built on their practice with other teachers or in, or like me with their own relationship with the spirit world. So you will have a lot of people there who are trained on very good healing work all over the world. Wonderful. Right. Okay. That's Be aware right what, now. Yeah. <laughs> when it comes to power loss, you know, the key term, the, the key aspect that you know your power animal has been left or stolen or uh, or left you or just scared away, it is that feeling of there's nothing I can do to make my life better. I ha- But another thing to talk about is, is that if you get your power animal back, if you get a power animal retrieval, and you do not listen to your power animal, you do not make the changes in your life to live a healthier life, as your power animal is asking, you're just going to go, fuck this, this person's not listening, I'm leaving. Mm-hmm. So part of living a healthier life, good diet, uh, good whatever it is that social your hygiene is asking you to. I once had a client who was a multiple personality. Oh my! And this person had been uh, through such trauma that that's why she was a multiple personality because she had been through hell. And one of the first things we did was a power animal retrieval to make sure she felt powerful enough to take care of herself and her life. Uh, about a year after her power animal retrieval, I ran into her and she goes, Roman, make him go away. I'm like, who? My power animal. It's like, what? I used to be a, 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 a foot to the wall party girl who was into all of this like really wild stuff. And I'm not going to name it in specific as well. PG-13 stuff. This is <laughs> okay. rated X. Mm-hmm. It was rated X stuff. Okay. That she was really into some heavy party stuff. And then she goes, ever since my power animal came back, I find myself drawing like a 17 year old girl. And now I'm like a suburban houseman taking care of all my children. So her life changed. Her power animal started guiding her to, to get in touch with her creativity, to, to spend time with her family, to stop partying, to stop doing drugs, to stop drinking so much. And these were very healthy uh, uh, changes that even though she was doing them begrudgingly, she did them. But let's say that you said no. And instead of taking care of your children and voicing your emotions to art, you drank a bottle of tequila a night and ended up going into a BDSM party every weekend instead of taking care of your children. That power animal was not going to stand for that. Nope. So, it, I mean, that's a way for her to lose the power animal is to complain about the changes well, not she's made. not necessarily complain but not act on it. Power animals can be very understanding, very patient, because we they know how difficult it is for humans to live this life. They've been watching us live life in the physical world for all since the beginning of time. So they kind of get it. It is when we don't act like they are there, when we ignore them, that they get upset. Um, now, um, Steph is asking... Do people have more than one power animal? Because she has one that shows up in meditations, journeys, hypnosis sessions, etc. <laughs> then there is another that shows up when she's not doing what she's supposed to be doing. Yes. The way I learned it is, is that the more we have suffered in life, the more attention we attract from the power animals. So the more difficulties we had or the more lessons we had to master, even if they were not suffering. The more we have been through in order to become who we are now, the more we are, have been likely to attract more power animals into our lives. There are some uh, traditions, for example, in the, 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 Indian, the, the, the native people of the plains of the United States. They have the, the, the sun dance. And people who become, become sun dancers, they purify themselves for up to a year or sometimes more on regular, almost daily sweat lodges. And then they go into this festival that is close to the public except to natives or people who have been approved to dance and they get pierced by the chest and they get hung by the piercings and from their chest and their back Mm -hmm. from a tree and they get stuck there for three days and three nights with nothing but small amounts of water and they are only let down when the when the piercings rip out of their skin and this is done it's been done for generations as a prayer for humanity, atoning 
for the spirit world, for the evils that we have done to the world, but also when somebody is trying to attract the uh, the the not necessarily pity, but the the mercy of the of the power animals into their lives. So there are things that can be done uh, if you need to. That's just one example of it. That reminds me of some scenes from a very old movie uh, called A Man Called Horse. Mm -hmm. Okay. Haven't seen it. Oh, all right. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was from the seventies, sixties or seventies. And it, I will look and, it up. Yeah. Okay. Um, it uh, Richard Harris, the the first Dumbledore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's dead now, but um, uh, yeah, he was in it. It, yeah, and he was going through, I think, being accepted into a Native American Indian tribe. If I don't, if I remember correctly, but that that. Uh, yeah, that was one of the scenes I remembered. I only ever had to watch that movie once myself. But, yeah. but anyway, yeah, very good answer. Very good answer for Steph, I'm sure. Uh, let's move on to the next one, unless we have more questions. I don't see any right here right now. Okie dokie. Okay. Uh, let's talk about soul loss. Okay. As we call it in Mexico, susto. Or in its more severe forms, espanto. Susto means fright. Espanto is the type of fright that you're going to take up running and not, never come back. Ooh. You know, it's like, I'm going to drop that from fear of bad. Normally, we call it susto. And most Mexican and Latino people will know susto about little kids, you know, who they see something scary. And they almost go catatonic. You know, they won't move. They're like, spoke so bad that they check out to their happy place. Uh, curanderas are very well known for taking a glass, like a sippy cup for the toddler, fill it with tepid water and dissolve one spoonful of cane sugar in there, mm -hmm. natural sugar, and just let them sip off of it to help them come back. Um, but it doesn't always do the trick. That's when you get into soul retrieval work. And soul retrieval is not only needed for children, it's needed for adults as well. It happens when something so bad has happened to a human being that a piece of that human being checks out. And that piece of themselves could not survive the trauma. It was so bad that they could not move through the pain, the sorrow, and all of those emotions, and they went to their happy place. In some situations, that piece of the soul, or pieces, if, if fragments the soul into more pieces than one, uh, could get stuck in that moment in time, in the middle world, but outside of time and space. Um, so when we're talking about that, you know, it happens that they're reliving that memory over and over again. It's like a PTSD in some ways. That is Groundhog Day. That's why I said I understand it mm -hmm. when, when we were talking about Groundhog Day. Because people who are traumatized can be stuck in their own Groundhog Day of trauma. A living nightmare. Mm -hmm. Waking Precise. nightmare. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, soul loss is an epidemic in today's world. It really is. Uh, because we are living in a state of societal soul loss. I remember when I was first training with the Foundation for Shamanic Studies, uh, one of the first things we did in our first class is that we did a journey, a shamanic journey, to talk to a teacher uh, or a power animal in non-ordinary reality and bring a message back from the entire class. And one of the things that uh, I learned is, is that I went there and I saw a serpent. And the serpent just looked at me and goes that, that the teachings we were being given were needed. Because humanity... And Western society in particular is currently living in a state of societal soul loss. And that is never more apparent than in our current social and political state in the United States. We have lost a piece of our souls and who we are as a nation and as a culture. And the, the, the serpent said that, and the serpent said, that, just look at your technology, he says, he, he told me. All that you're doing is designed to put you closer to each other, to bridge that gap between all of those souls that are fragmented. Uh, people want to understand soul loss better. Look at an army or a, a, a war veteran. I have lost count of the war veterans I have met who had soul loss, who when I looked at them and, I, and they asked me to, to say, what do you see with me? You know, people do that with me a lot. And sometimes when I do say, well, let me look. Very rarely, very rarely do I do that nowadays. But 
the few times that I've done it, uh, I've seen a lot, particularly with war veterans, that pieces of their soul are still at war. That's PTSD. It is exactly what PTSD, whether it's from war, from abuse, from, uh, from sexual assault, from childhood abuse, it doesn't matter. Pieces of ourselves has checked out and they left to their happy place or they're stuck in the moment of trauma for all eternity. Mm-hmm. Currently, the medical paradigm that we're holding in in Western medicine doesn't know a fucking thing to do for PTSD. I have lost count of how many people have told me says that they don't know how to deal with it, that I'm going to have to live with it for my whole life and that they can give me pills to help with the anxiety and that's it. And it's because it's not fully a medical illness. It is partially a spiritual illness. It is a fragmentation of the soul. This associative ident- identity disorder, uh, multiple personalities, are also a form of soul loss. It is when our, our, our entire uh, mind fragments into a million little pieces to deal with trauma. Now, does the, uh, the, the fragmented soul, isn't that a a breeding ground for even more. It's just a, it's an ever continuous cycle. Uh, you can't get out of the darkness or the badness or, or it's that because, type of thing. It's because it's very similar to power loss. Mm-hmm. You know, most people who have soul loss also have power loss. So they're defenseless. And in, in, in their own way, their minds trying to wrap them, their minds around the trauma, they tend to manifest similar situations to try to solve it in the present moment because they could not solve it in the original trauma. And they keep re-injuring themselves over and over and over and over again. Most people in today's society have at least a small amount of soul loss. It is one of my personal wounds that I'm working right now with uh, a healer that I respect very much to help me help me heal like that I can become an even better healer for other people. It is healing my soul loss. Um, and soul loss has a degree of severity. There is what we Mexico we call espanto, that is not present in the Western paradigm of uh, of soul loss. And espanto is is when like that little kid, you know, who just went that they go catatonic. Mm-hmm. It is when an adult does that that they have espanto. I have, in Mexico, I have seen people go to the curanderos because they were wasting away. They couldn't eat, they couldn't drink, they couldn't sleep, nothing. All they could do was sit there like a vegetable staring into space because something scared them up or traumatized them so bad. Um, question from the chat room. Can a person tell if they have soul loss? The number one question that I ask them before I start our reading to see if I need to look into it, because... On your own, it's almost impossible unless you have learned shamanic healing yourself and you know the signs, unless you have experience to know what you're looking for. People who don't know what they're looking for almost never know. Uh, but one thing I will always ask to see if they need to see someone to do shamanic divination, to see if they, they, they need the soul retrieval or not is something very simple. And it's like um, to think of the moments in which they were traumatized when their life changed forever and see where they hold that feeling in their body and how does that feel? If there is a feeling of emptiness anywhere in your personal space, there is a chance that there is either power loss or soul loss. And the next question that I ask is simple. And that is, do you feel that a little bit, little piece of you died that day? Then I normally also ask, do you feel that you left a little bit of piece of you behind that day? Mm-hmm. And finally, when they can't quite point down where all the trauma has happened, I do something that shamans, I believe, in New Zealand and in that part of the world, I'm told, used to do when they see somebody that they know has the potential to have soul loss. And I ask them something very simple. When did you stop singing? Mm-hmm. Okay. Pro- profound question, if you think about it. Because singing is a form of our expression, of our power, of our well-being, of a lot of these things that both power loss and soul loss take away from us. Now, if if you have this series of patterns, you know, if, if you have physical illness, mental illness, emotional illness, or you just have a series of events on your physical life that are very negative, that keep repeating themselves, there is a really good sign that soul loss or power loss, or both are part of the issue. 
if you keep getting into abusive relationships, if you keep getting into toxic jobs or toxic friendships, or if you keep getting hooked on drugs or alcohol because you're medicating for something you just can't, you can't quite fully pinpoint, you just know it's there. I mean, it is this fundamental illness that permeates through our entire lives and we're powerless to stop. That is the fundamental signal for power loss and soul loss. If you have PTSD, yeah, you have soul loss. If you have multiple personality disorder, yeah, you have soul loss. I have no problem saying that because mm -hmm. I myself have lived with that diagnosis of PTSD. And I've known enough people with multiple personalities as my, as my, as my clients that I am perfectly comfortable saying that there is a connection between those two diagnoses. Oh, sure. One thing, mm -hmm. one thing to talk about. Uh, oh, any, any any further questions? I don't see any. Okay, I, I have a question. Um, sure. If someone has lost their soul and they find it or they know where they've lost it, is it better just leaving that part in the past because that would be like picking up something rotten and putting it back on you? Well, it's not rotten; it's wounded. It's like saying that just because a child has been sexually assaulted, you're not going to adopt it. Oh, okay. No, sure. I mean to leave okay. it with the trauma rather than to bring, you no. know, the... No, okay. it, is, it is definitely needed to be brought back unless the soul piece itself does not want to come back. It okay. is not your choice, it's the choice of your soul pieces. Because if you do not bring back the soul pieces, the illness that you're suffering in the present time will never go away. It is like saying that somebody stole your kidney and you don't want it back. You need your kidneys. Oh, yeah. I see. Yeah. But soul loss is such a monumentally big deal because, as you said, it is bringing back someone who's very ill. Um, one of the things that I hate about the modern New Age movement, and blessed be all my pagan brothers and sisters that I have a lot of friends in the pagan community, that I see so many books on paganism and magic on the occult who have all of these spells, you know, that you can light a white candle in a pitch black dark room and call back all of the pieces you have to yourself and to, uh, that you have lost throughout the years into yourself. And doing soul retrieval on yourself through a book or a meditation or a video on YouTube or any of these things, it's like doing brain surgery on yourself by the instructions that you found on a pamphlet that you found wet in the middle of the street yesterday. <laughs> that, that's very specific, um, but I understand what you're saying completely. Okay. Soul loss, it is the, one of the pinnacles of shamanic healing. Only very experienced and well-trained shamanic practitioners and shamans actually do this work. There are indigenous shamans around the world who don't do soul loss, soul retrieval, that they don't at all. That is not part of their culture because it is that difficult. How long does it take to get one's soul, soul pieces back together? Oh, the soul pieces, the soul retrieval is easy. The aftercare is what's the big, the big deal. Sometimes the, healing the, itself. the healing itself comes out. I can do a soul retrieval in one hour, but uh, the, back, the, 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 the backlash is, uh, I'm going to give you a good example, okay? Last time I had a soul retrieval, I went in because somebody uh, had advised me to do so because I was in a, in a relationship that was become codependent. It started very healthy, but it, it became codependent. Uh, and I was I was really suffering deeply from my PTSD, and I was suffering very deeply from a series of issues with addiction, and a lot of these issues that come with mental health diagnosis of post traumatic stress disorder. If you're ever familiar, you know, with v veterans who medicate and the many things we do to cope. While well, I was doing most of them, and uh, one of the things that happened is is that as part of the soul retrieval, when I got my soul pieces back. I felt and I realized that that relationship that I've been having for 14 years, that at one point was the very core, not only of my identity, but of my support system. You know, my lover of 14 years was the world to me. I could not live without him. I didn't want to live without him. But I realized that I had to. 
because our relationship had become toxic and that it had become a expression of my soul loss that I was hanging on to him as a way of medicating. And I realized I had to let him go and break up. And the stress of dealing with all of these unresolved emotions from childhood that led for me to have a codependent relationship as an adult got so serious that I ended up with an ulcer and the ulcer almost turned to cancer. Had I not had the support of my friends and my family by my side to help me work through my own emotions and not swallow them, but healthily deal with them, I don't know what would have happened to me. Now, my case was incredibly extreme because I have a very difficult case of PTSD that was compound over many years of abuse. But it is not unheard of. There are sounds of people who uh, sold pieces left because happiness that they had that was very lasting ended, like the idea of the relationship breaking up again, you know, that they that a piece of them leaves with that relationship. And I'm going to talk more about codependent relationships here in a second. Okay. Sometimes that, that soul retrieval uh, brings back all the happiness that you lost. I mean, you can never tell what the soul is going to bring back with it, but you have to be prepared to deal with it. And unfortunately, as painful as it is, it's like avoiding surgery, you know. Yes, surgery sucks, the, the, the rehabilitation sucks, and it's expensive and all of these things. But in the end, after you have it, you're going to have a, be able to live a far better life than you would if you, than if you stayed sick. Mm-hmm. No. Any questions? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nope. Okay. An interesting part of soul loss as well, okay, uh, is, is that soul loss has its own energy. So again, if you go to anybody for a power animal retrieval or a soul retrieval, and they don't do a shamanic extraction on you first, go, don't, don't see them again. Actually, don't even stay for the soul retrieval. Because they, they need to clean that wound before they patch it up. Yeah, sure. But another, another interesting thing um, that I've seen in Western culture as pertains to soul loss is, is that it doesn't always come from trauma. Uh, A lot of it comes from relationships, and particularly with women. I have lost, I have lost count of my female friends and clients who come to me because they are relationship centered and they cannot get the right relationship to fit them. That they feel that they have to be in a relationship for them to feel completed. That saying in Western culture of "you complete me." That moment when we do that and we place the responsibility for all of our well-being and happiness in the person that we're in a relationship with is a form of soul theft. We are Mm -hmm. giving away pieces of our soul to someone who doesn't need them. It is like doing a kidney transplant on someone who's not compatible. And people wonder why those relationships fall apart. And why you end up with baggage that never goes away. It's because when you gave someone your heart and soul, you never got it back. How do you expect to continue to function? And the fact that you felt empty to begin with, that you have to have somebody else's soul fill a hole within your own heart. It is a number one component that something is horribly wrong in your past that needs to be fundamentally healed. You will never find a relationship that can fill that hole because that hole needs to be filled with your own heart and soul. To do anything else will only uh, lead to spiritual codependency. That sounds like it could be a major handicap for, you know, there's some women that have babies just in order to try to achieve that, to fill that void. And uh, I, yeah, that's an eye opener to see that that is a burden that is actually put on that baby's soul. Well, it's beyond that, you know. I, it's also it, it that that leads into our next illness, which is soul theft. People can steal your soul. Yeah, you can steal other people's souls without meaning to. Mothers who don't want to let go of their babies when they grow up, and they want to keep them in, in home forever to be mom, little kid mommy forever. They can take the little piece of them that was their inner child and take away their heart and soul and their joy. There are ways in Mexican witchcraft and you can keep uh, a child attached to the land and attached to the family forever. And it's a form of soul theft. I know this because my mother mother, 
confessed to me that she cast that spell on me when I was a baby. Oh, yeah, wow. that's like clipping the wings on the bird, you know. So, yeah, mothers can definitely take pieces of their babies with them and keep them forever. Uh, even after they die, people can do that. Not only mothers, but everybody. Uh, and we ourselves as human beings, we don't have to be parents to do this. You know, it could be that we had a relationship with someone who was the perfect mate for us, our, our perfect guy, girl, goat, whatever. I don't care. That to us, they were the epitome of what we wanted. And they broke up with us. Or something went wrong and the relationship fell apart and we broke up with them. It doesn't matter. But we never wanted that relationship to end. In that moment, we can reach out in the astral, in ordinary reality, and take away that piece of them that we never wanted to let go. And that's when we enter that cycle of spiritual codependency and relationships that echo that wound. And we never, ever again are able to have a good relationship because we're hanging on to something that doesn't belong to us. Now, Roman, is there uh, such a thing as, say, an unconscious soul? Um, some people may have undergone a severe trauma and their souls just severely bruised or um, inanimate for a while, but not necessarily dead. Have you, are you, do you understand what I'm asking about? Well, that there's not necessarily soul fragmentation. They're just uh, um, kind of checked out a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it would be like, um, you know, the, having the, a hand out of commission. You know the way I, I like to express that? Huh. It is the feeling of being beside yourself. Hmm. That your spirit is not fully aligned with your body. You're not quite here yet. You know, you're not fully in this world. I see a lot of that, a lot. And I have to just gently guide the body, reconnect to its energy centers, make sure it's everything flowing properly, and that's that's an easy fix. Uh, but the, the 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 problem that I that this carries with, and this goes back to soul loss. Okay, it is people who are uh, uh, hooked on chemical dependency, whether it's marijuana, alcohol, um, uh, alcoholicinogenics, or any type of drug that puts them besides themselves. Uh, Drugs and alcohol are a form of drugs are a form of soul loss, are a form of soul fragmentation. It's what they do naturally. To put yourself in an altered state without being in control, it's inviting soul fragmentation. It is why in tribal cultures, shamans and shamanic practitioners taught people who wanted to learn to alter the state of mind how to do it shamanically, like that they would not fragment. I have lost track of how many of my clients uh, who were addicted, who wanted help through their addiction by sh doing shamanic healing, refragmented their souls shortly after being uh, having a soul retrieval because the first thing they did was get high. And you've just negated all of that work. Mm -hmm. Precisely. Yep. And it can also lead to a different type of illness, which is uh, possession. When you are not fully in your body, you, you someone else can just jump right in there. Sure. I had lost count of clients that I had who were heavy drinkers, who all of a the sudden they became like, I'm going to die from drinking alcoholics, and they didn't know why, when before that they only drank socially. And when I did a shamanic divination, I realized that there was the spirit of a deceased alcoholic who was hanging around his favorite bar, and he wanted to drink like when he was alive. So when he saw an empty body of someone who was, you know, that drunk to be that far besides himself, he just took over. Wow. Mind-altering substances were never meant to be fully recreational, period. They were meant to help a human being transcend the physical and touch the sacred because it is the legacy of humankind to look upon the face of the divine in an altered state of consciousness and bring that wisdom back. We all do that naturally. However, Western culture has lost that lore from its indigenous roots. So now we look at mind altering substances as recreation when in reality before they were ever recreational they were purely used as tools for us to achieve a greater st st state of spiritual consciousness <laughs> yeah, that makes sense I mean because if, if, if it, it used to be a community thing to use yeah. um, these plant medicines and now it's uh, you know 
when someone is when they're made illegal as they are in the United States, um, it becomes very hard to do it as a community or in a shamanic practice. Yeah. Any questions? Not that I'm seeing. I don't have any right now. Okie dokie. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on to the, uh, the, the meat and potatoes of what I do, okay? Mm-hmm. Every shamanic practitioner has their, their thing. When I was first started training with the Foundation for Shamanic Studies, my teacher looked at me and go, Roman, when you're ready to do the work professionally, you're going to find, and all of you will, she said to the class, you're going to find something that you're really, really, really good at, that everybody comes to you for. You're going to be well known for that. Some people may even get worldwide renowned for that. And I go, nope, it's not going to happen to me. I'm just doing this for my own well-being. Not going to do this as a gig. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> and fast forward over 10 years later, poof, here I am. And that is the energy of ancestral healing. And particularly releasing generational curses. I have lost track of where people have come from to see me. I mean, I get a lot of people who are vacationing in Seattle. uh, But part of the decision making to come to vacation in Seattle was to come see me for the sessions. I believe that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, I have people from all over the world. I mean, so... um, and the energy of, of an ancestral uh, generation of a generational curse in Mexican culture, where that term comes from, for me. I mean, other cultures have it and other cosmologists share it. But the way I became familiar with it was from, from the Mexican people, uh, particularly in the southwest of the United States. Um, it is when we have generational patterns that get passed down after generation, generation after generation, that they take a life of their own and a power of their own, and we can no longer help to stop them. When they have grown out of control, like an avalanche that's just destroying more and more as each generation goes by. For me, this particular type of work started a few years ago when uh, I was doing a reading for one of my regular clients. And they told me that every single male in their family for the last 12 generations had died of the exact same illness at the exact same age. Wow. And they go, what can we do about it? How can you help us, Roman? And I'm like okay, I have to be honest with you because otherwise you won't come back to me. I have no idea how to help you. And I send them to the foundation's website, see if they, they could find someone there to, to do, but nope. And I went to my teachers in Northern Ordinary Reality and I asked for help. And over the next couple of years, step by step, this teacher taught me on how to release a, a uh, generation curse. Wow, and you- okay. Generational curses are very, very deep. And they're a form of ancestral healing because normally it doesn't matter that if they began with somebody literally going, booga, 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 you're a toad, or whether they belong, they began with your alcoholic great, 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 great grandfather who used to beat his family. Mm-hmm. It's in a form of ancestral healing because the first person included in that pattern, the person who began it, never fully crossed over to the spirit world. They never became at peace. They are not an ancestor. They are dearly departed. They are dead. They are discarnate. And they are going around their future generations, perpetuating their own illness on them by trying to get help. Or some of them are doing it on purpose. I had clients of mine who came to me because of abusive relationships. And I found that there was a a deceased relative from many generations ago that was doing that to the women, not only after they died, but if he found the spirit of a woman that he liked when they were alive, he would keep her prisoner in the spirit world when they were dead in order to become more powerful and use her magical strength to continue to perpetuate this type of energy in the living. So generational curses are a very serious thing, and so is ancestral healing, because not only do we have to have the strength to unravel all that illness out of the bodies, minds, and souls of the, of the living. But we also have to cross over those who are perpetuating the illness. Because in reality, when it comes to the dead, it is a lot like living in a house when somebody has a cold. You know, One person gets sick, then they get better. Then another person gets sick, and they get better. And before you know it, for the next year, you're passing that the same cold around everybody until everybody gets sick at the same time and everybody gets better at the same time. 
Mm-hmm. The biggest difference with our generational curse is, is that the person who's getting everybody sick is dead. And there is no way of making him better other than crossing him over. Because that is part of the lot of the shaman and sorcerer both in life that is dealing with the issues of the dead and in particularly helping them cross over. Because the dead don't belong in the world of the living. When they stay beyond their welcome, when they are no longer needed here, they tend to create illness. Sure, they fester. Absolutely. Yeah. They fester in their own issues. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's when you end up with someone like me. I mean, I I do the divination to see if that's really needed. Then I I unravel the negative energy that connects them not only to the dead, but all the living people who are in part of this pattern. Then what I also do is, is that I cross over the dead. When I am done with that, I take something that most people don't know how to do. It's is that I look at the very personification of the curse itself and I set it to rest. I release it from the world of the living. And after that, I do the one thing that most people don't know is necessary to fully release a curse, and that's to a soul retrieval. Because in order for any curse to be cast, whether it's a generational curse that began as a pattern that got passed under generations, or once again, whether it was a little booga booga booga, you're a toe tap curse, in order for that curse to take hold, the sorcerer or the deceased relative has had to have a hold of a piece of you in order for that to connect. And when they took away that piece of you with them to do the curse, not only do they have a connection to you, but they have a hole in your aura to continue to make you sick. So that is my process of healing generational curses. And I am very happy with my work because a lot of my clients, as the years have progressed, are beginning to send me testimonials about how much it changes their lives. I have a client of mine who's come back to me, I think, two or three times now because she found different uh, parts of her uh, family family's patterns that needed healing. And for what she tells me, uh, in the months and years after the healing that we did, other members of her family began changing their patterns without her saying or doing anything. And for the very reason being is, is that when the dead are no longer around perpetuating their bullshit on us, pardon my friends, I love my dead friends, but for the love of God, don't do that to us anymore. Uh, (laughs) there is no need to continue doing things that are not good for us. Sure. Makes sense. Ooh, golly. I don't see (laughs) any questions in chat yet. Um, Anybody have questions? Put them forth now or forever hold your... Yeah, because we only have a few minutes. We only have a few minutes left and I just laid a whole big one on y'all. Yes, you did. (laughs) (laughs) So if anybody has questions, this would be the perfect time. Do we go to 11 or to, uh, I mean, do we go another 12 minutes or another uh, hour and 12 minutes? Oh, we can do whichever one you want, but it's usually just another 12 minutes. <laughs> oh. Mm-hmm. It's gone by very quickly because that's how Roman shows go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we also had a lot of wonderful participation from the chat room. So I want to thank everyone in the chat room for asking yes. questions. Thank you yeah. all. Okay, anonymous dude, his mind is blown. <laughs> <laughs> you should have seen my face when I started this process with uh, with ancestral healing and releasing generational curses. I had the same reaction. And every time I went back to a non-ordinary reality to meet my teacher to learn more about the process, I it, it happens the same. It happens all over again. This spirit blows my mind. This teacher blows my mind every time. Because I'm now uh, starting to learn how to do it with spirits that are tied to the land. When the land is cursed. Oh my. Okay. Um, and it's, it's a similar process. I'm just not as, um, as adept at it as I am with the living. You'll get there as you do more practice, right? Precisely. Mm-hmm. And I don't get to do it very often. How long does it take... Like, for instance, how many, the average or the usual, the typical uh, amount of sessions it takes to get a person back aligned where they, you know, where they need just to get them back to alignment. Um, But afterwards, I know, I I would guess um, it's a lifestyle, permanent lifestyle change. But I mean, 
I guess there's like a little probationary period or a little bit of a liminal space that they'd be living in. Uh, so how, I mean, an amount of typical amount of sessions and it depends the time. On, on them and the amount of work they're willing to do. My clients, when it comes to ancestral healing, uh, normally they come to me for a maximum of two to three sessions and for the most part. Okay. Most of them can do it in a single session and they don't have to come back because they feel that they want to just watch their life and the life of their loved ones change from that moment in time onward. And if they come back to me, they come back to me for a different issue that is also generational. But it really depends on how much change they want to see in the many patterns that we all get passed down our generations. Because it is very rarely that we all simply get handed down one generational pattern from our family, and that's it. You know, Most of us have been programmed with issue after issue after issue after issue. And it's not necessarily that we have bad families. This is that that's the way our ancestors were thought, our parents and grandparents and grandparents. And all those generations back, it's the way it's always been, and it's not, has, it was never questioned. My work comes in for for longer term care. The more people question the negativity that they got handed down from their parents, which is the workshop that I'm going to be uh, teaching on January 15th here at Mystic Sanctuary in Tacoma, and also later on the 21st in the big in the Seattle Psychics Association Big Psychic Fair in Seattle. I'm going to be teaching a workshop on the basic ways on how to release not a generational curse, but begins healing our patterns that get handed down from our ancestors. And when to know how to come when to come to a practitioner like me and says, dude, this is way more than I can handle. Mm-hmm. Now Ramon, what uh are you talking next year? Because we've we've passed both January and February sixteenth. No, it's uh, March. March. Okay. Okay, cool. March fifteenth and March the twenty first. Okay. One of them is in Tacoma, the other one is in Seattle. Wonderful. Now, um, Steph is asking, do most people have a boost of confidence after? It is more than a boost of confidence. Mm-hmm. It is the energy of complete release. They, uh, my, my clients, I, I see their, even their faces and their demeanor change. Mm-hmm. It, they look like they have released a burden that they never even knew they had. And they look relaxed and happy and healthy and in much better space. Yeah, it does give you more confidence, but it also gives you the realization that the patterns that you have to live in life can be your choice instead of what you were taught. And that is a huge life changer. Oh, golly, yes. Indeed. Um, now, <laughs> Anonymous, dude, I know the answer to this question, but I'll let you answer it. Um, has Roman written any books? I am in the middle of writing three books. Ooh. I'm working on a book on uh, the worship of La Santísima Muerte. And, mm-hmm. you know, we have done a show on her before. Yep. I am almost done writing my own Reiki manual for Reiki practitioners who want to use it as part of their class book. And I am writing a novel that I'm completely stuck in with a horrible case of writer's block. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> You need to get your power animal with that. I need to do some serious ritual work to get me unstuck out of this three box because I have a horrible case of writer's block right now. Oh. Yep. Take a vacation. Do something. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You should burn the books and then start from fresh without that blocked yeah. energy. Yeah. Anything um, else? How long does that liminal space after? that moment that the person is aligned, how long does that last? It depends on the person. Uh, Personally, it is very powerful within the first 24 hours. Uh, And then in particular within the next week and the next month. Beyond those three, it's depending on how much you sink in into the work and continue to work on yourself. Mm. Yes. And a lot of my clients i do give them homework yeah yeah that makes sense the spiritual hygiene that they need to do absolutely Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, would you like to tell people once again how they can get a hold of you and um, and just you know call and talk to you? I guess maybe if they need to. My uh, the best way to contact me is through my website, and I do believe you posted about it. Yep, I will do that. Teotoltonali dot com. Mm -hmm. um, it has a contact us form. Um, my uh, my email teotoltonali at gmail dot com. Uh, I work at a mystic sanctuary in University Place, Washington. I do all my shamanic healing and my 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 my, uh, my, my readings there. Their number is two five three three zero two three five six three. And you can call them during business hours to make an appointment to come see me. I don't do distance work. I don't do distance uh, readings or over the okay. phone, nor do I do readings or healings over the phone. Because if you have been listening to the show, you can see how incredibly irresponsible that would be of me. Because what I do is very intense. Yes, and I need and to be able to see and to fully um, evaluate the, the effect the work is having. Okay. And I, so I don't give people too much. So, uh, um, personally, yeah, those are the best two ways to get a hold of me. Marvelous. All righty, I've posted links to the website and Facebook page in the, in the chat. And I am on at Mystic Sanctuary every Wednesday and every Saturday from okay. 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Let me see if I can find that one. The, the yeah. Mystic Sanctuary. Sorry, I was a little slower on that one. <laughs> <laughs> You've definitely given us a lot to think about after this show. Ramon. I normally do. Yeah, yes. <laughs> it's good. That's part of your work. It's amazing. Yeah. Okay, so Mystic Sanctuary is something to do with our um, role-playing games online. <laughs> no. Uh, the, the, the website is Mystic Shop with two P's and an E at the end. Okay. Com. All right. Thank you. <laughs> at least that's what, what I sound. <laughs> if, not, if not, it would be uh, their, their phone number is 253-302-3563. And they're open Tuesday through Sunday. Very good. Lost that. Definitely, every day thank of, you. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Every day of the week, we have a different reader or healer at the store. And we, all, we are all very good at what we do. Um, and we have a lot of classes and events. So if you want to look up Mystic Sanctuary on Facebook, we post about it uh, on Facebook, all of our events. So you can always look Mystic Sanctuary uh, shop, uh, the shop page on Mystic Sanctuary on Facebook for, for events. Cool. Nice. Um, Steph in chat is saying thank you. I learn so much every time I listen to Roman. Wish I were closer. <laughs> All righty then. Well, um, we there's only about two minutes left, and I think we've kind of run our course for the evening. Um, I, I want to thank so. everybody in chat. Want to thank Roman uh, most most importantly there. Another job well done, young man. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Cindy. Uh, Cindy of uh, Kansas City Astrology and Tarot as my co-host this evening, and she always brings it. Which my pleasure. Pleasure. Because sometimes I lose it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank final you. words, guys. Well, I want to thank you all so very much for tuning in and listening in, mm -hmm. and remember. As always, any healer that you go to, our job is to empower you to walk your own path towards healing. No one should ever be taking control of your healing but you. Wise words. Very wise. Mm -hmm. All right, then. Um, I guess that's it for this evening. I'm not sure what we're doing Wednesday because I've got a, a previous engagement and won't be at my computer to run it. So unless Jacob comes up with something or, or June does, um, it might be a bye week. Um, but anyway, I will take us out with, uh, I, well, excuse me. I hope everyone has a great week. I <laughs> hope you had a, a, at least a decent Valentine's Day, a, even if you were just burning an effigy of uh, love's gone <laughs> by. <laughs> 
uh, <laughs> yeah, go uh, pet your dog, uh, squirt the cat, do whatever you need to do. Um, and I guess we will talk to you next time. I'll take you out with Chains by Rose Cousins. Bye. Black is the devil, dark is the night